He was born to a famous and accomplished family. He had a, a larger-than-life, very famous dad, Tom Harmon. But Mark Harmon was far from pampered. He trained his off. He was very dedicated. He wanted everything to be right. He worked his way from starting quarterback to star surgeon. Well, let's just say his bedside manner was exemplary. But Harmon wanted to be more than a pretty face. He knew that was just jeans. That wasn't something he had to work at. I need to challenge myself. I need to stretch, and I need to do things differently. He took on dark and challenging roles. Wasn't what any of us expected. He terrified the crap out of me. Only to have his shot at movie stardom misfire. It sort of branded Mark as maybe this guy who couldn't actually carry a film. But Harmon wouldn't quit until he came back to score the biggest series in primetime. I like to keep him guessing. Showbiz survivor, persevering performer, and risk-taking actor, Mark Harmon. In 1985, 34-year-old Mark Harmon had reached the pinnacle of primetime fame as the hunky doctor Bobby Caldwell on the critically acclaimed hospital drama, St. Elsewhere. It had taken him nearly a decade in the TV trenches, taking on bit parts, and at last, his diligence was paying off. Harmon was one of America's hottest young performers and had a following of adoring female fans. Mark Harmon was a female magnet. The ladies loved Mark. Mark Harmon, very, very pretty young man plays the plastic surgeon on St. Elsewhere, and the women of America fall so madly in love with him. Mark was a star on the rise with a steady paycheck, but being another pretty face on primetime was not his goal. He wanted to push himself as an actor. After two years on St. Elsewhere, he voiced his desires to the show's writers and producers. He was very much wanting to have a little more meat to his character and uh, wanted more depth. We said, okay, well, let's come up with a really, hopefully, original and interesting way to write your character. Because of Mark's range as an actor, uh, we decided, oh, there's a darkness there that we can explore. The writers returned to Mark with a radical idea, one that would push him into uncharted and controversial territory. They wanted Harmon to play one of the first TV characters to contract AIDS. We didn't know as much about AIDS, and there was, there was a lot of prejudice about the idea of AIDS and a lot of fear. People were afraid of mosquitoes landing on people with AIDS and landing on them. If a person with AIDS coughed, they would go and see their doctor and were worried that they would get it. Um, so. There was a lot of fear back then. If Harmon accepted, he'd be written off the series, lose his steady paycheck, and potentially damage his public image. I mean, uh, that seems like, holy crap. You know, if I do this, what's it going to mean for my next job? What, what, what is this going to say about me? What is this going to do in terms of my fans? Are, are they going to think that I am my character? For Mark, the choice was obvious. We came up with the AIDS story, and he totally embraced it immediately. I was shocked that suddenly his character was going to contract AIDS. Wow. To some, it was career suicide, giving his most popular character yet a death sentence. But Mark wanted to expand his boundaries as an actor, no matter what the consequences. He's not satisfied with making money. You know, he didn't, that wasn't a motivator for him. I mean, usually when people get on a show, they're like, oh, hopefully it lasts seven seasons and I become a multimillionaire. And, but that obviously was of no concern of his. Uh, it was more about the work. You know, I, I have always thought that being an actor means that you're supposed to kind of hang it out there and take some chances, you know? And I don't see any other way to learn other than to doing that. Mark's inner drive was set in motion at an early age. Thomas Mark Harmon was born in Los Angeles on September 2nd, 1951, to football great Tom Harmon and actress Elise Knox. He was the only son of famous parents and a family that included two older sisters, Chris and Kelly. He had a, a larger-than-life, very famous dad, Tom Harmon. Tom Harmon was a Heisman Trophy winner. When you talked about the top two or three or four running backs in the history of college football, Tom Harmon was at the top of the chain. 
From an early age, Mark was drawn to both his parents' professions, sports and acting. He saw a lot of show business. His father would do commercials. His mother was an actress. The set and cameras and all of that became second nature to him. And being who Mark was, he studied all of it. But for a time, it seemed Mark would follow in his father's footsteps. He played football and started as kind of a mediocre player and, and worked hard and became a great football player. He trained his off. He was very dedicated. He wanted everything to be right. His father's job as a football commentator regularly kept the elder Harmon on the road covering college games. Mark didn't see much of his father growing up. When his father was home, Mark talks about being a kid, playing catch in the front yard with his father, making one bad throw, and his father quitting the catch entirely. I mean, that's a rugged way to come up as a young man. Mark's father was a driven, disciplined kind of guy, and he expected the same thing from his son. Mark's strict upbringing and hard work paid off when he joined the storied UCLA Bruins. By his junior year, he worked his way up to starting quarterback. But to his father, then working as an announcer for UCLA football, Mark still had a lot to prove. Tom obviously went out of his way to be totally neutral. In fact, if Mark got mentioned at all, it was exceptional. He downplayed it all the time. Mark's debut as starting quarterback for UCLA came in the opening game of the 1972 season. The opponent was the formidable Nebraska Cornhuskers, then on a 32-game winning streak. We were one of the worst teams in the last five decades. Nebraska, we're ranked number one in the country. We weren't, we weren't ranked in the top 100. It was pretty intense. Mark did not seem nervous at all. As the senior Harmon analyzed his every move from the Coliseum press box, Mark scored a touchdown to give UCLA the early lead. The first image I have of Mark is, uh, you know, in a UCLA uniform. And after the touchdowns, he would go like that. By the fourth quarter, the score was tied. As the clock ticked down, UCLA took possession of the ball. We're tied 17 to 17 with less than 30 seconds. Mark completes a 25-yard pass play to one of our receivers down to the 20-yard line with just seconds left on the clock. The fans are going crazy. We kick the field goal, and we win, and the entire stadium is just going absolutely crazy. It was very exciting and one of the greatest upsets in UCLA history. Mark engineered the win. He, he was more responsible than anybody for UCLA having this momentous victory. After the game, Mark received congratulations from fans and media, but there was no word from his father. At last, the young quarterback made his way off the field. Tom Marmon came into the locker room and finally told his son. He played a great game and he was proud of him. Mark promptly burst into tears. His dad was saying to him in that little act, you know what, you, you were the top of the chain here. I'm proud of you. Tom Harmon pushed Mark Harmon. But if you can kind of keep it together, as Mark was able to do, there's a payoff later on in life. In the case of Mark, his dad had instilled that desire to, to be the best and to be perfect. While Mark continued to excel at football, he made inroads into his mother's profession as well. Between team workouts and academics, Mark found time to take private acting classes. And in his junior year, he even landed his first on-screen credit. Mark got his big break in acting by uh, another familial connection. His sister, Chris, married the pop star and TV star Ricky Nelson, whose dad was, of course, Ozzie Nelson of Ozzie and Harriet fame. And Ozzie had a new show called Ozzie's Girls and cast Mark in his first role, a walk-on role. It would be a pivotal moment, even if the role was hardly high profile. Ozzie Nelson cast Mark as a guy in a gorilla suit. I remember Mark saying that Ozzie had told him, whatever part it is, you take it. He played in a gorilla, and he loved it. He just knew right then and there he wanted to act. 
Mark had gotten his first taste of the TV soundstage, and he was hooked. When he graduated cum laude in 1974, Harmon was invited to the New England Patriots training camp, but his heart was no longer in the game. His sights were now set on acting. Football stopped being fun for me. It was time to put away things like that and go on toward a career and something that I wanted to do. Mark approached acting with the same intensity he'd brought to the gridiron. Throughout the 1970s, he hit the audition trail, and his hard work began to pay off. He started doing guest appearances. I saw he did little things uh, like Laverne and Shirley. Hi, I'm Victor. I'm here about your ad for the Jeep. For six years, Mark took on every role he could get. Good luck on my kick. I miss. Who's going to believe me? Professor Al is wondering if... Those one and two and three line parts that seem to be thankless roles, but you know, they're all essential to being comfortable and ready when you get the part that has, you know, 23 lines and, and more. His drive has always been about doing the best in the work that he is doing at that moment. No matter how big or small the role is, you always do your best and you do the job, you get it done. By the early 1980s, Mark was ready to take the next step, and he was about to make a bold gamble on an underperforming series that would transform his career. By 1974, Mark Harmon had graduated from UCLA with a stellar record in the classroom and on the football field. But instead of pursuing a career in sports, he chose to test his talents on the small screen. For nine years, Mark pushed himself as an actor, giving his all to even the smallest of roles. Mark's career still kind of struggling a little bit in the beginning of the 80s, uh, but he had gotten what could have been a break, going to read for a show, Bay City Blues. Bay City Blues was a baseball show about a uh, farm team. It was a wonderful script. It was from Stephen Bochco, who had done Hill Street Blues, and there was a lot of buzz about the show. He went to read for that, but uh, happened to hear that uh, just up the hallway a little bit, uh, there was another show being cast. They heard that Bruce Paltrow was auditioning for St. Elsewhere. St. Elsewhere, a drama set at an underfunded Boston hospital, earned critical praise. But on the cusp of its second season, the series was in trouble. St. Elsewhere was far from a ratings hit. After that first season, it was almost canceled. But St. Elsewhere had a reputation as a nurturing environment for actors. Moreover, Mark was a fan. Literally knocked, you know, on the door himself and um, got got the his uh, audition. He came in with absolute confidence, but no ego. In terms of the audition, it was down to him and Don Johnson. I said, I don't know, Don Johnson, I just don't get this guy. I, I think Mark's, you know, really, really interesting, really right for our show. And of course, the next, within a year, he had been cast on Miami Vice. In the end, Mark was offered parts in both series, and the 33-year-old actor had a tough decision to make. Go with a much-hyped but untested baseball drama, Bay City Blues, or the underperforming St. Elsewhere. When the negotiations came to be on St. Elsewhere, I was advised not to do it. Uh, I happened to be a fan of the show, and I wanted to do it. I wanted to be part of it. Thankfully, he chose St. Elsewhere's uh, Bay City Blues when asked it for eight episodes. In 1983, Mark joined a tight-knit and talented cast that included up-and-coming performers such as Denzel Washington, Howie Mandel, and Ed Bagley Jr. The St. Elsewhere cast was like a family. It's very difficult to be an actor and come into a show as a regular after it started. Everybody's got relationships, everything's, the rhythm of the show's set. I met Mark on the set, you know. Hi, Ed, there's a, you know, we've got a new character here, a Bobby Caldwell. He fit in instantly, everybody fell in love with him. I liked him right away. He was a great team player and we were all very much on that team with him on St. Elsewhere. Mark didn't just win over his co-workers with his everyman charm. His dedication to the show was equally impressive. He cares deeply about the work. If he would mess up a line, he would get so upset with himself. He wanted to do it perfectly all the time. 
and he was uh, always quite the perfectionist. However, in September of 1983, when plastic surgeon Dr. Bobby Caldwell first appeared on screen, it wasn't Mark's devotion to his craft that made audiences take notice. Dr. Bobby Caldwell, he was one of the original McDreamies. He looked great in civilian clothes, and he looked even better in his scrubs. He didn't need to do much to show his skill and to attract the audience. Let's just say his bedside manner was exemplary. I see those. Wow, those are great hands for a plastic surgeon. Gosh. <laughs> My best friend from residency used that line to propose to his wife. I do, I do. <laughs> it was clear right away from the moment he came on that he attracted a lot of female viewers. Women were camping out outside his house. He gets a big kick out of telling the story that women would come up and say, how do I look, and show their breasts. Mark, you know, was huge at that time. He was just, he was uh, on every magazine cover, television, the chorus commercials. It's a lot of hard work, dedication, but it's worth it. Coors is the one. Mark was paid a reported $1 million to be the face of Coors beer. He had wealth and fame, but Harmon wanted to evolve as an actor. After two years at St. Elsewhere, Mark decided it was time for pretty boy Bobby Caldwell to grow into a more complex character. And the writers agreed. When the series returned in the fall of 1985, loyal viewers scarcely recognized the new Dr. Caldwell. The idea was that he, you know, he had this relationship and it broke up and it was ended badly, and then that led him to just being a sexual predator. The disfiguring of St. Elsewhere's handsome MD took a painfully literal turn when Caldwell was slashed by an angry lover. They take his looks away from him with a slashing incident. That, that's one of the most amazing TV moments of the 80s, just so unexpected. Many viewers felt betrayed by the violence done to their dreamy Dr. Caldwell, but they were in for an even bigger shock. They were about to learn that he had contracted AIDS. This is somebody that the audience had fallen in love with, so to give him AIDS would have a huge impact on the audience because they had an investment in his future. Mark was energized by the opportunity to push himself as an actor and fought to make his character's struggle with AIDS ring true. We worked very hard on the AIDS uh, episode to, to have it be factually correct um, so that people could talk about it. We, we wanted people to go, man, I didn't know, I didn't know about that disease. Mark and the producers had worked hard to make Dr. Bobby Caldwell's struggle with AIDS plausible. But were fans ready to see their favorite surgeon suffer? By 1983, Mark Harmon had found stardom on St. Elsewhere, but he wanted to be more than just a pretty face. The show's writers obliged with a daring new storyline that ran the risk of alienating Harmon's fans. On January 29, 1986, viewers tuned in to discover a new chapter in Bobby Caldwell's story. Well, I, I thought it was an infection. Kaposi's sarcoma? I've got AIDS. Some were outraged. But what was horrifying is once we, once we did it, we got bags of mail. One of the letters was from a woman who was furious with us, and she said, literally, um, why didn't you give AIDS to somebody who is ugly? She said at the end of her letter, We're never gonna, I'm never going to watch your show again. But the naysayers were in the minority. Harmon himself was deluged by sympathy cards and letters. The episode was the highest rated of the season, and critical acclaim was nearly unanimous. Well, I think that was the biggest and most impactful thing in his career. because people took him as a, as, a, as a serious actor. But this one, it, it got respect. While many praised Mark for trying to expand his range, 
People magazine wasn't ready to let go of the primetime pinup. In 1986, the editors named him their sexiest man alive. We gave him so much heat for getting named Sexiest Man Alive. And he, of course, was embarrassed by it. I don't think he was thrilled by it. He was like kind of a little bit, uh, he seemed a little uncomfortable with the attention. I don't think Mark uh, would get caught up in the, in the looks thing or the movie star thing at all because of the fact that he knew he, knew he inherited that. That was just genes. That wasn't something he had to work at or achieve. In the spring of 1986, Harmon left St. Elsewhere and Bobby Caldwell for yet another challenging role. Serial killer Ted Bundy in the made-for-TV movie, The Deliberate Stranger. It wasn't what people expected after St. Elsewhere. It wasn't uh, what any of us expected. For the primetime leading man, playing a psychopath was a risky decision. If you do this role right, I... Uh people are going to be creeped out because you're not going to think, oh, sweet Mark Harmon. You're going to think, oh, uh, killer Ted Bundy. But he wanted to go there. I thought that he was a remarkable choice. I wanted a all-American, good-looking, attractive, attractive to women uh, playing that role. Charming but psychotic, Ted Bundy embarked on a multi-state spree of rapes and killings and is believed to have murdered upwards of 35 women. Mark did total immersion in this role, to the point where he tried not to sleep so he'd be in, in a weird state of mind, like the character. He asked me if he could go down to Florida to visit with Bundy before his execution, and I said, no way. I do not want the washed lies or all the excuses that he's liable to hear from quite an awful person. I think maybe it was the first time he really inhabited a character and couldn't just throw him off and go home. There's the dark side of all of us. Whether we let that out or not remains to be seen. When the TV movie aired in May of 1986, it changed the way America saw the sexiest man alive. It's hard for me to think of Ted Bundy without thinking of Mark Harmon. Uh, in the sense of, in my head, I don't see Ted Bundy, I see Mark Harmon. It terrified the crap out of me, I'll tell you that. After two months of filming, Harmon had so fully immersed himself in the role that he found it hard to shake Ted Bundy. It would take several weeks before Mark fully emerged from the darkness, but his dedication paid off. So convincing was his portrayal that it earned him a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actor. His career was on the upswing, and that same year, his private life would begin to heat up as well. Pam Dauber at the time, who was known uh, for Mark and Mindy, uh, Mark was at a dinner party. Uh, a mutual friend of uh, theirs, Gina Hecht, who was an actress, introduced them. I think when they uh, met, it was pretty clear to all of us that it was the real thing and that there was a great chemistry. They seemed very smitten with each other. She also was aware of the trap and the joy of success, and I think that was, uh, that was a great... Uh, thing for him to have somebody to help him understand the whole insanity of, of Hollywood. She's not part of any Hollywood glitter lifestyle. She's a very substantive woman, and Mark was drawn to that, obviously. When they decided to take their relationship to the next level, Harmon and Dauber did it in their typical understated way. They invited people over to the house for a barbecue and announced they had gotten married earlier that day. Mark is really one of the few actors who says, I don't need the spotlight, I don't want my personal life in the headlines, and live that. 1986 had been a banner year for Mark Harmon. Following a bold exit from his primetime series and a riveting performance as serial killer Ted Bundy, his career was running full throttle. 
Even so, he had managed to keep his personal life out of the spotlight. 1987 would be a whole different story. Nineteen eighty-six had been a stellar year for Mark Harmon. He had been named People Magazine's sexiest man alive, won critical praise in a chilling TV turn as serial killer Ted Bundy, and married actress Pam Dauber. At age thirty-six, the ambitious actor was eager to take on a new challenge. He got his chance when legendary writer and director Carl Reiner approached him to star in his new teen comedy, Summer School. Carl is a great comedy director. The Jerky, that was a huge, you know, success for Steve Martin. His first film out of the box, out of being a stand-up comic. And uh, we, we, you know, as soon as the discussion went on for, for Mark, we, we all agreed he would be the right guy for the role. It would be an unexpected leap from killer Ted Bundy to laid-back gym teacher Freddie Shoup. And Mark had his doubts. He had built his reputation on drama, not making people laugh. If you're primarily a dramatic actor, the comedic lead role in a film is, uh, can be a pretty huge stretch and um, a big risk. I spoke to Carl about that. We both felt that he, he was just right for it. I mean, the character calls for a, a young, fun-like, loving, a athletic person that happens to be a, a teacher. He was perfect for the role. And he's so charming and, you know, handsome and a like, great smile. I remember Carl Reiner said he had seen Mark in The Deliberate Stranger. And his comment was, anyone who can play a killer that convincingly has got to be a great comedian. Mark was the kind of guy who said, gee, I don't know if I can do this. And, and, and I think that made it a, a challenge once again for him. If Carl Reiner tells you, hey, you could be funny doing this, you kind of have to go with Carl Reiner on that one. Is Carl Reiner ever wrong? Mark signed on. He would stake his big screen ambitions on the success of summer school. Under the guidance of Carl Reiner, Mark dove in head first. I remember one of uh, we were all watching him shoot the uh, the scene uh, with the dog where he kisses the dog, and we were like, "Oh my God, he's going for it!" And I remember thinking. How many women would like to be that dog right now? <laughs> as positive an experience as it was for everyone on set, in August 1987, summer school debuted to poor reviews and disappointing box office numbers. When summer school opened, it made 35 million at the box office, which is okay, but not great. Summer school was panned by the critics. He'd made the leap, and the leap hadn't exactly succeeded. It sort of branded Mark as maybe this guy who was great as part of an ensemble on television, but couldn't actually carry a film. Mark followed summer school with the crime thriller The Presidio. Even with high-profile co-star Sean Connery, the film bombed earning just 20 million at the box office. And after three years as core spokesman, Harmon lost his lucrative advertising contract. The buzz surrounding Mark Harmon was dying fast. And his personal life was about to be turned upside down as well. Mark's sister, Chris, who was of course married to Ricky Nelson, uh, had been going through some issues. Ricky Nelson passed away tragically in a plane crash. Mark started worrying that his sister had some drug problems. Chris had a son uh, who Mark was close to, and Mark became concerned. Worried about the safety of his nephew, Mark decided to seek custody of him, which unfortunately led to a very ugly and public court battle. When Mark and Pam arrived at the courthouse in August 1987, they were met by a throng of reporters hungry for details about the family drama. I don't think he ever expected that it would turn into a big thing. I think he was looking at it as a private family matter, and though it was going to court, I think he really underestimated the public's interest in him. Mark thought that he was doing the right thing, and Mark probably was doing the right thing. He was getting blasted in the press because America hates it when it looks like someone is trying to take a mother's child away. People were very upset, and they were upset with Mark. You know, you could say that trial was a perfect storm of nightmares. 
Here's Mark Harmon standing up for what he thought a man should do, which is protect his nephew, dealing not only with his famous family, but a famous family on the other side. And so every day to the courthouse, every recess, every break, there'd be cameras there. There'd be people asking personal details of what he was going through. After three days of heart-wrenching testimony and lacerating press coverage, Mark informed Chris's lawyers of his desire to end the trial. Later that day, his attorney announced that Harmon was dropping the case. When all the craziness of the trial was going on, he was the one person that stepped up and said, enough's enough, too much blood has been shed, and we need to stop this, and that must have been really difficult. But it was the right thing to do, and I think they all agreed on it, about it, and they all went to family therapy afterwards. Things seemed to be resolved, so what began with good intentions to try to help his family ended with good intentions helping his family. Brother and sister walked out of court arm in arm, and it appeared the family was ready to heal. But Mark had more damage to repair. After his failure to launch a big screen career, he needed to put his professional life back on track too. In the late 80s, Mark Harmon's skyrocketing career was sputtering. A handful of movie roles failed to propel him to big screen stardom. The press turned on him during a painful public feud with his sister. The one-time media darling had lost his luster. But for Mark, it was never about fame. Harmon was dedicated to delivering the best performance he could, and his new role was family man. In the spring of 88, Mark became a dad. His wife, Pam Dauber, had their first boy, Sean. Four years later, another boy, Ty, was born. He has a great stability in, in his life, you know, with, with Pam and, and the family. I think he very much went to school on how he was raised, and it seems like Mark and his wife have, have perfected the art of, of being able to live fairly normal lives. Though they remained in Mark's hometown of Los Angeles, he shielded his family from the glare of Hollywood until one night in January 1996 when the spotlight fell upon the Harmon home. Mark was in his house and he heard a crash and he heard Pam yelling and he runs out and sees a car flipped over. It turned out that a Jeep Cherokee had flipped over and burst into flames. There was a 16 year old kid hanging upside down in his seatbelt. There's a young boy trapped in, or a teen trapped in the car and he runs, gets his sledgehammer, bashes in the car, drags out the kid and the car explodes seconds later. When I pulled him clear, the uh, I'd say from his thighs down, we're, we're pretty much on fire. And I uh, rolled him on the ground and got on top of him, pretty much put out the flames as much as I could. The victim was rushed to the hospital and survived. Mark had saved a boy's life, but in 1996, his career was also in need of rescue. Mark had helped develop a detective drama for ABC called Charlie Grace. Midway through filming the sixth episode, ABC tells him, hey, don't bother. The abruptly canceled Charlie Grace was only the latest in a string of failures that included the poorly received movies Wyatt Earp and Magic in the Water. After a three-year slump, Mark returned to familiar terrain, the TV hospital. In 1996, he joined the cast of Chicago Hope, but the deck was stacked against the series. When Mark Harmon joined Chicago Hope, not only were they losing the creator, David E. Kelly, but the star, Mandy Patankin, is also leaving the show. Chicago Hope, though it was a great show, it was very unfortunate timing um, in that ER had also come out around this time, and he was another hospital drama, um, and a really exciting one. And unfortunately, Chicago Hope paled a bit in comparison. The idea was that Chicago Hope wanted to bring in somebody who was really handsome and to counter the George Clooney phenomenon on ER. He's going up against NBC's ER, headlined by George Clooney. But one thing about Mark Harmon, loved a challenge. Mark brought his trademark work ethic and team spirit to the ensemble cast, helping Chicago Hope stay alive and earning critical praise for the next four years. But scheduling and cast shakeups, plus stiff competition from rival ER, proved too much for the series. In 2000, Chicago Hope was canceled. 
At the time Chicago Hope ended in 2000, uh, Mark was almost 50 at that point, which is not the point at which you're considered most desirable to, to uh, TV casting directors. Um, so you wonder what he would do. Mark continued to do what he'd always done. He kept working. In 2002, he was cast as a bodyguard in the popular political drama The West Wing. It was a guest starring role, but Harmon threw himself into it as if it were a lead part. West Wing is the quintessential political drama. But beyond that, it's a show that remade a lot of people's careers. Martin Sheen, Rob Lowe, and then Mark Harmon. He played uh, Agent Simon Donovan. He was a bodyguard. He obviously had to be extremely focused and, and very disciplined. And yet, by the fourth episode, he was actually quite humanized. This guy isn't small time, Miss Craig. You're being hunted. By the way, I can't guarantee anything except to say that if you're dead, chances are I am too. Is it a spoiler alert, however many years later, to say that his character dies at the end of his four-episode arc? That's what happened, and it was, it was felt. It was a nice little TV tragedy. Here was a guy that an actor that in four episodes made you care about this guy so much that it really felt bad when he died. I need NYPD at a Korean grocery at 98th and Broadway. Sir, I hate to be a problem customer, but I'll get a Milky Way bar pretty soon. You wanted him to sort of stay with the series, take over the series. He'd really crafted a great role there. The run may have been brief, but Mark's performance had resonated with viewers. The West Wing earned him an Emmy nomination and would kickstart the most successful chapter in Harmon's long career. <laughs> Throughout the 1990s, Mark Harmon appeared in several series and films, but he failed to return to his 1980s prominence. And at 51 years old, Mark seemed in danger of disappearing. But Harmon didn't give up, and in 2002, he had a breakthrough. With an Emmy-nominated guest run on The West Wing, he soon set his sights on a new primetime role. In 2003, Don Belisario is creating a show called NCIS, and Mark gets interested in playing the role of Special Agent Jethro Gibbs. NCIS is about uh, Naval Criminal Investigative Services. They're basically like the, the, the police for the military. Jethro Gibbs is the lead character. He's the, the boss. I think Mark saw a lot of possibilities there, and Don Belisario had a terrific reputation for being, you know, a showrunner with the right feel for a hit. With series such as Magnum P.I. and JAG already under his belt, producer Don Belisario seemed poised to deliver yet another winner in NCIS. But Mark Harmon wasn't even on his radar. Don Belisario is very specific about casting. From what I understood of <clears throat> the casting for Mark uh, is that they thought that he was a, a pretty boy. He's going, are you kidding? Yesterday's news, I mean, you know, he, he has no heat around him. And then he saw Mark in the West Wing. After he saw that, he realized he'd be the perfect Jethro Gibbs. First it was like, I don't even want to see the guy. Then it was like, don't show me anybody else. I got my lead. Mark leapt at the opportunity. As Special Agent Jethro Gibbs, he would lead a misfit band of military detectives, a perfect role for the square-jawed actor. Better yet, the series would be shot in Los Angeles, affording him more time with his wife and two sons. He's like, good, I get to work in LA, I get to go home at night. Except that, with the beginnings of NCIS, there was no going home at night. He said the first day of work on that show was 21 hours long. And that was a Monday, he said. And then on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we also saw the sunrise. He said it was nine consecutive six-day weeks and that the hours were like i said incredibly long he found the set very disorganized I'm, my favorite quote is mark saying you know at the beginning of ncis we didn't have this luxurious thing called scripts 
the show was a success. It it came together, but it came together with an enormous amount of exhaustion and sweat and tension. All that hard work paid off. When NCIS hit the air in 2003, the many fans of JAG followed. Throughout the first few seasons, the ratings climbed. Mark was part of the ensemble cast, but he was also more. Every ensemble show still has a leading player. The point of the show gets directed through one character. And, and Mark certainly is that guy on NCIS. Mark brings a silent strength to the role of Jethro Gribbs, which is, I think, very true to a lot of uh, Marines and military men. I'm going with you. You're not going anywhere. Sid. Sir. You still talking? Why are you still here? By its fourth season, NCIS had become a top 20 show. But behind the scenes, it was reportedly as disorganized as ever. As I understand it, Mark was pretty unhappy with the way the show was run. The toll on a crew uh, and a cast can be really detrimental. I can absolutely see that he would want to make sure, looking around at the people that he cares about, if things are going south for them uh, and it's too much, that he would absolutely say this isn't reasonable. Mark, in the end, it was like he was the head of the family. He wasn't just the star of the show or the star of this unit, but that he had to protect the life and health of all the people he worked with. Rumors swirled around Hollywood. Infighting between Harmon and Belisario just might drive the star off the series. But it wasn't Mark who would be pushed out. In May of 2007, CBS announced that Don Belisario was leaving the show. With Don gone, NCIS continued its ratings climb. By 2009, it was the single most popular drama on television. He's the quarterback, head of the team, not only as an actor, but as a crew member. And I think he very much sees himself uh, as a team making a show happen. From viewing, uh, what obviously has happened is that the show has reflected the sort of television that Mark Harmon most likes to make. Uh, ensemble television where every actor, every character gets to shine a little bit. Mark absolutely uh, sets that tone, takes the lead, comes over and meets the guest stars, makes a point of letting you know that they're there for you, you know, if you need anything. When I finally got to work with them as an actor, I, I got that sense of generosity that I've heard so much about. He did everything he could to give me more power and more strength. And that, that was such a generosity that I've never experienced from any actor, especially a star. And that, that was truly amazing. After five decades in TV drama, Mark Harmon's quiet dedication and willingness to push himself as an actor have made for one of the most enduring careers in Hollywood. He always seems to be landing on his feet, and now he has the number one show. As long as the writers can, can give him the material, if they don't let him down, then he can go on for as long as he wants to go on. I think that Mark's longevity is attributed to the fact that we've said over and over is his work ethic. He works hard at it. He works hard at his career. He's very clear about where he wants to go. He's a, a hero of mine. He's a guy who I've tried to emulate in my own way, he's, he's a hero of mine. He always embraced roles that were outside of what was the perception of who he was. And I think that shows a great amount of, of courage for an actor. I like to keep him guessing.